Welcome to the Lazy Money Machine, where we show you the easy, no-nonsense way to financial and time freedom. Welcome to the Lazy Money Machine podcast. We're back for another episode. And today, we're going to talk about morals and ethics. David, how are you over in Auckland, New Zealand? Beautiful, man. I'm, this is my, my work day today. So I've made a, a crap lot of calls this morning. I still have okay. another four. Uh, so I'll do a full four and a half, five hours of work today, wow. which is pretty full on for me, as you know. Um, so this, this is my uh, this part of my four and a half, five hours. Uh, and uh, this is the part that I've been looking forward to because it's when I get to chill out and talk what's on my mind. And this topic that we're going to be discussing today is because of something that happened this morning. But how are you, my friend? Yeah, I'm very good. Uh, thank you for asking. Um, nice to be with you again. We've uh, we've not spoken for a few weeks, so that's always good because then there's a lot that has happened in our lives and in our businesses. So I think today should be a good time to go and talk about some uh, some things that happen in business. So what happened in business with you, David? Oh, so many things. The market's going nuts. But absolutely nuts. So at the moment, um, I think we, oh, I uh, bought and sold four houses just last week um just just anything that i'm buying i'm basically just selling and still creating really good win-win situations but uh, everyone is so desperate to to move money from whatever it is that they have it into the property market and it's gone absolutely berserk i have not seen a market this hot in shit i don't even remember probably pre-gfc would be the only time that i've seen it this hot with this much desperation there so it, it's gone nuts and actually that that's what led me to to what i wanted to discuss this uh today because yeah, this but can, be, before 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 sure. we go there can i can i ask so um people might think you know buying and selling but are you not buying and selling to the same people how can you create value in a market like this so who do you buy from and who do you sell to and, and why is there a difference there Mm. That's a good question. Basically, it's um, it's about the the what I have to to disclose or talk about is um, the way that my business operates when it comes to to trades. So um, as you're aware of, because I think I talked about it when I talked about myself in an earlier podcast, I set up a business called Joe Public. So essentially, what we did there, we bought and sold properties. We did renovations. They tend to be high end kind of stuff. Uh, what I find these days is that um, that there is more of a need for investment property rather than high-end property. And high-end property, was, it's always a pain in the ass to deal with. It's a hell of a lot easier. So instead of creating the value by making something look pretty, what we do is that we make something rentable. We make it uh, sexy enough for someone to be able to get top dollar in terms of rental, to meet all the healthy home um, criteria over here in New Zealand. Uh, and just make it in a, and set up all the right people and structures around it. So essentially, we package a property transaction for an investor. We buy it really well, so we buy it at a discount. So we always have quite a few uh, people on the go, and, and that's why I have project managers. When I say we and I say I, it's kind of the same thing. I basically find the deals, uh, but I don't really look at the deals. Like those four properties, for example, I, I haven't seen them, and I'm not going to see them. It's not something that I do. I don't really look at houses anymore. So essentially, the project managers that are working with me in conjunction with me as a JV, um, they do all the heavy lifting. They find the deal, negotiate the deal, get everything together, all the quotes. If we don't renovate it, they actually get everything quoted and ready to go, and they help the next buyer to get mm -hmm. that quote to fruition. So we, we're taking the uncertainty out of the transaction for the buyer. We're buying in a specific areas that I've analyzed, so we only buy properties in areas that I approved. So we only target at the moment, we're only targeting three major areas over here in New Zealand, uh, three and a half. Uh, we're still doing Auckland. There is still some, some interesting deals in Auckland. Um, so that's the only areas that I target and I go with. Uh, and then, we, like I said, we package it and put it on the market to our VIP clients, and we usually sell those houses within a few hours um, because people know that what we're selling is bloody good. Yes, and the buyers they buy it because they want to be in the, in a rental business, right? So they buy it off you because uh, you've analyzed the market. So they get a house with possibly with a tenant in there and with management and everything, right? So they get something that's ready to go, 
uh, and you make sure that it is ready to go so that it that after you buy it it's fixed up or it, it's changed or whatever needs to be done uh, put a tenant in and then move it on to the to the buyer yeah correct and we also have a few clients that that they like trades so uh, what we do is just set it up as a trade so instead of us doing the renovation they basically get it they we make a match you know obviously on the transaction but yes. then they do the, the renovations, any kind of work that's necessary, potentially a lot of compliance work. A lot of the properties that we buy tend to have compliance issues. So that, that means... Because for people that don't know what compliance issues are? Something illegal being built, something that shouldn't be there in the plan, something that they've done that was dodgy. Uh, from plumbing to wiring to actually structures that, that shouldn't be there. So uh, we, we have a lot of that in New Zealand. Uh, because people tend to be very handy, um, and uh, when they're handy, they do things that they shouldn't do. And when they're not compliant, you could have issues with councils. And that means that you could have requisition orders, orders to fix, all stuff that I like, because it work from your neck up kind of thing. So uh, it's it just essentially dealing with the right sources, the right people, uh, and making something that's not compliant into a compliant building. Um, so we do a lot of that work. Uh, it takes time. That's the only problem with compliance, because once you have to deal with counsel, you know that you're going to have issues. It, it's it's going to take time, uh, but it's very doable and it's pretty simple and straightforward in the big scheme of things. And you're adding a lot of value doing very little work, which is what I love. Right. Gotcha. Well, I think that was very clear. Thank you for explaining that. I think in this podcast. We sometimes need to go a bit into the details of how these deals work for people to get a feel for it. Um, but yeah. I think in general, in property, there's always two things that we look at. One is, is there a way to add value to a property? And two, can we generate a cash flow out of the property, right? Those are the two main things that we always look at in in deal. Uh, like for, for the properties that you're buying, they might not be rental properties, but by fixing them up and making sure they're compliant, you can go and rent them out. So that's where you add value and you generate a cash flow. So... Nice. Thank you for explaining that. You pulled me back, man, because I think that uh, that I made an assumption, and I always say that when you assume something, you make an ass out of you and me. Um, and uh, I, I assume a lot of times that people know what I know, and uh, sometimes I forget, and I know that we've talked about this before, we just forget just how much experience and how much we've done. And uh, I was having dinner the other day, for example, with neighbors, and I was telling them, you know, I was buying and selling houses, blah, blah, blah. And and I, I was assuming things, and they're like, shit, no, it, it, you say that it's easy, but what you're saying doesn't seem easy at all. It seems freaking complex and a pain in the ass. I'm like, no, no, it, it's easy for me, I guess. I just realized that I'm talking on on someone's head that has been doing this for almost 20 years. Um, for someone that hasn't done it, it's complex, it's scary, it's not something that they feel comfortable with. For me, it seems like Tuesday. It doesn't really make a difference whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, and that's what we're trying to do with the Lazy Money Machine. One, on the podcast, obviously, we uh, you know we talk about this and we teach you guys and share what we know. Um, and all, also in the future, we're going to you know bundle and package this so people can pick up a product from us and, and go and start learning this because... Um, yes, it's a lot of experience that you and I both have, but the principles behind a lot of what we do are, are relatively straightforward and many people can learn them. And then, of course, you need to go out and, you know, yeah. uh, get your feet wet and, uh, and do it yourself. But well, I think that's that's what we're all about and we want to share. And there's so many interesting things in property and your market is very different from where I am. So I think that makes it all uh, all very interesting. And I think, yeah, we, we do need to explain the details of the deals so that uh, people get a feel for what's possible, David, I think, and, and get an, get excited. Definitely. I think that, that it's a lot to get excited about. And uh, even, actually, I need to say that I've had so many phone calls and so many emails and so many comments on social media about the podcast and how much people are enjoying it. So nice. it, uh, it's really good to, to have that, you know, because that level of feedback, um, makes it all worthwhile. Not that this is, I, I honestly don't feel that this is how it works for me. It's talking about something that I feel passionate about, something that probably happened recently anyways, like what I wanted to do today. Um, just, just to me, it seems very natural and that people say that they're getting a lot of value, that they wish that they've had something like this before, you know, and, and that they, they enjoy it. It's not just that they're learning, they're, they're learning and they say, you, you're actually funny. I, I quite like this Eric guy and uh, all that stuff. So it's good to hear that what we're doing is helping people and that people are finding enjoyable and useful. 
that's the two uh, purposes that I have when I wanted to get this started. And yes, when people want more stuff, I'm sure that we'll create different products and different cool things so that you guys can take it to the next level. But at this stage, I think that we're both all about the same thing, which is just giving value and helping you guys inspire, get started, and get the, the experience, the wisdom that you can only get by doing deals, by being in the market, which is what we are. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I want to mention uh, for people listening, it's never too late, guys. I mean, uh, you can build, you know, something very decent in, in a couple of years, right? I mean, it doesn't take a lifetime to go and build a property portfolio or to start getting, uh, you know, money out of property. So uh, it's never too late if you're in your 40s, 50s or 60s and you, you have money available. There's still plenty of things you can do. Um, it's It's never too late. It's not like... Uh, you need to buy something now and wait for 20 years before you can get some return on your money. There are ways to do that much, much quicker. So the, the, the fear of it's too late or I wish I did this before, please get rid of it. Um, just get started. There's still plenty of things to do even now. So, Yeah, I completely agree with that. Uh, I, th I would say that some of our best clients and people that I've worked with are people in their 50s and 60s. Um, usually as well because they have a lot to start with. So they tend to start with a lot of equity, but they have these hangups about using equity and, and especially lending. So you're you're looking at that generation where leverage for them yes. is a word, right? Uh, they're absolutely terrified of borrowing and mortgages. And once that you get over and overcome that that fear, we can transform that equity into real good, sexy cash flow that changes their life. And uh, seriously, it's not two years. We, we can do that with someone with chunky amounts of equity, we can transform their life in six months. It, it yeah. literally takes that that short in terms of an amount of time to create significant amounts of cash flow and returns out of property. Uh, it's definitely never too late. We've had clients in the 80s and uh, it, that's, you know, when you think about it, that that's amazing, right? But yes. in that situation, the funny thing is that it's not about them. They, they bypass that situation. They're happy. They're doing it to help their grandchildren, to great grandchildren. We actually had a client that was helping to try to set them up for the future. Uh, and that's awesome that uh, you can do it at any age. You never have to retire. You can create the lifestyle that you're after. Uh, that's why property is, is so sexy and business in the same way. Uh, but property is just a little bit simpler uh, form of business, really. That's yes. what I love. I mean that's 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 really also my view on my cash flowing uh, portfolio that I'm I'm still in the process of building is that if I can get it to the level whereby there's a, a relatively basic income coming out for me by the time I'm no longer around that basic income can go to the kids right and they have something that gives them choice and that's all what what we're talking about right if you if you have passive income from something like property or business or stocks or anything and then you have the choice to work or the choice to, uh, you know, record podcasts on a Tuesday afternoon in your shorts, right? So that's what we're doing. Correct, actually, in my shorts. Yes, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. David, thanks for explaining that. Um, the, the, let's, let's go to the topic of today. So you were mentioning that something happened today uh, that triggered you or yeah. gave you the download or the insight to go and, and bring up something we want to discuss today. Can you frame it, what happened and, and what you want to talk about? Definitely. definitely. So it's a, it's a property that we're, um, that we're renovating. It's a major renovation, actually. Um, separating into different income streams. So it, it, it's a fair bit of work. We're in the final stages. So we're literally in the last six days of work. Uh, so it's getting to that, you know, now it's pretty. It looks the path, right? So people without a vision could see it now. It's, it's yeah. that the walls, uh, are, the walls are painted. That's always the thing, right? If the walls are still ugly, not people yet. go, wow, what's <laughs> this? <laughs> the, but the wires are not hanging out. Let's put it that That's way. Right. Uh, so uh, we've gone past the, the painful stage. We finished the council stuff, which was really what delayed it a little bit more. Uh, and I had it sold. So I had it sold um, literally for the last three, four weeks um, that someone wants it. You know, it, it's under contract. It's a good client of ours. Uh, nice guy. And, and look, I'm not saying that I like every client, but I like this guy. He's, he's, he's really cool. He's one of those ones. Even even if he wasn't cool, I'd still do what I'm going to do. Okay, but let me tell you the story. Right. Uh, he's a nice guy. Um, the contract, you, I could get away from it because what happened this morning is that I received another two offers. Mm. Not one for 40 grand more, unconditional. So, I could get $40,000 more 
and another one for $53,000 more, but that's conditional on finance. Um, and now it's the, the hesitation always, right? Because it's not, it's not easy. I mean, it's not a lot of money by, you know, by, by my interpretation of money at all, but it's still 40 grand more. So I have options here. And option one, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, I can find a way of cancel the agreement because it can be done. Okay, I just I'm pretty good when it comes to legal stuff, so I just have to find a couple of clauses that were in initial right. I can do something and find a way of getting out of the agreement. Uh, I, look, I didn't even look for it, but I know that I can. Uh, so I could get out of the agreement legally without any comebacks. It's impossible to enforce it. Okay, so I would win any kind of legal battle. No one would be stupid enough to go into it. So I could just break the agreement, take the other one, make another 40 grand. Um, look, it's not. It's not bad. It's easy and it's legal. There is nothing that I'm doing that's illegal, not even remotely illegal. Then the other option, obviously, is to tell the person, um, my client, and uh, say, hey, this is what's happened. Um, I actually put the property on the market with another agency just because, actually, it, it helps with valuations. It helps with everything. So... Um, Going back to it, so I put that property in the market because it's good for valuations. It's uh, good to actually see it going there. Uh, and look, you never know. If, if you get an offer like that, then at least you have choices. You have options, right? Mm -hmm. So the next phone call was to, uh, to this guy. And I said, hey, we have 40 grand more. Um, the way that I see life is that life is it's needs to be fair, needs to be a win-win. Um, we have options here. You can just take it at the at the price that, that we agreed um, and then just keep it as a buy and hold. I will just go to the contract. I'll lose on the 40 grand. You know, I've already made money. I'm okay. It's, it's not going to hurt me. But the way that I see it, if we can make 40 grand, what about we actually take that agreement? We both make an extra 20 grand each. I'll find you another one and do it up and make sure that you get something as good or better than this one. And you have an extra 20 grand before Christmas. How is that? Right. Obviously, he went with option B. Even if I gave him option one, he could have potentially just, again, do the same thing. He could have just bought it and then put it on the market and make 40 grand himself, you see. But yes. the reality is that I think that if you give people that transparency and that clarity and, and you, only, you actually give a shit, you're genuine about it, people will take the right choice. Um, because no one is there to screw other people. Uh, but it is hard, and that's what business is all about. Um, legally, there was nothing wrong with option A of canceling the contract and taking the other contract and making 40 grand. Morally, it felt wrong. And it felt wrong because I have an agreement. And yes, sometimes you can get out of an agreement, but it's not about getting out of an agreement. To me, your word is your bond. Mm. Uh, more important than anything that's on paper. Uh, I know for a fact as well, because of what I've gone through with businesses and properties and the like, that you can argue absolutely stupid, pointless shit. Absolutely pointless. I've had legal uh, cases with businesses that had absolutely no grounds whatsoever, especially American business. I had one with an American business that they tried to... Um, to, to go after us for something that was absolutely ridiculous. And they're just highly litigious. So their strategy is to just bleed you to death, essentially, on legal fees, which, yes. look, in that situation, they couldn't because I have more than enough to be able to fight it. But it still costed me money to be able to fight a case that didn't need to be fight, uh, fought because it, it was pointless. So um, the legal um, situation, it, it's an interesting one because it's not – you don't have to be right – to take it to court. You just have mm. to be ready. It's a bluff, right? Um, it, for me, it's not about being legal. It's about being moral. It's about being ethical. It's about being able to sleep at night. And that's what I wanted to do in this situation. Just go back and be like, what are my values? What, what am I going to feel like later on in a, in a day, in a week, in three years, in five years' time? Would I feel better if I take option A or option B? 
and when you start thinking of it in that way, when you when you disassociate from what's happening and you just look at at it in a third party perspective, usually answers become a hell of a lot clearer. And uh, and then you you get that certainty that what you're doing is the right thing. And when you come like that, um, everything is pretty simple and straightforward. And, and look, this, this is a great problem to have, right? It's between making money or a lot more money. Mm. Uh, I wish that every problem was like this. Uh, I'm right. pretty sure that everyone listening to this podcast is, is wanting my problem, right? Like, do you make 40 or do you make 20? Well, shit, you know, that's a, that's an extra, an extra on what I'm already making. So it's, it's not a, it's not a horrible thing to have, but imagine when it's the other way around, when the potential is either lose 40 or lose 20. Well, once again, I will still take the 40 grand lost if that feels right, if it is morally the right thing to do. It definitely feels that way. And for me, everyone that I do business with, that's what I need to know. And I know that we have conversations about your business uh, and uh, and what you have gone through and what you did as well at one stage by giving up part of your shareholding and everything else because it didn't feel right. Mm. Uh, that to me says a lot about a human being. And, and one of my best mates, I actually need to bring him into this podcast, uh, Ben. Uh, ben Doyle is a great developer in Sydney. And uh, literally, he went through divorce and GFC at the same time. What's uh, the last bit? Divorce and what was that? GFC, uh, the global oh. financial crisis of 2007. Oh. Right. Okay. So uh, he had uh, everything that he should have done in that situation is, is essentially liquidate and start fresh. And he could have done it because he didn't have anything that was PG, personal guaranteed. So that means that he could have just closed the company, moved on. He didn't do that. He took the hit and made sure that created a plan for anyone that invested money on him to pay them back with interest. That took him years because this mm. GFC wasn't a fun place to be when you're property developing, okay? It was hard. It took him years of hard labor to get back and actually pay everyone, every, even if it wasn't guaranteed. They paid every single person what they were owed plus interest. The difference that that made into his business today is tremendous, absolutely tremendous, because people believe in him. Mm. People invest in people, not in businesses, not in ideas. They believe in you. And they know that this guy, what he did is he went above and beyond just to make sure that he did the right thing. And that to me speaks volumes about a person. Uh, and it's not easy. It's really not easy to do. And I haven't been in a situation as bad as that one. And I always use it as an example because I know that he's cool about it, actually me talking about it. Um, but because it's, it, it just says so much about a human being and uh, about our business because everyone in the business will know that people are more important than profits, that your word is more important than ripping someone off. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that I that I want to be a strong advocate for, uh, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it will come back to haunt you if you don't do it. I personally truly believe that if you keep screwing people over, things will come back to you. And not in terms of karma, it's just common sense because the world is a very small place and it's getting smaller all the time. There is a lot of information out there. That information is going to come back and it's going to hurt you. So you have to be very, very wary with that information out there online and what you say and what you do because it will come back to you if you don't do the right thing. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things I wanted to say about that. Um, the one thing that I wanted to add to this is that uh, we, we need to consider the concept of time. Um, when we make the decision to sell a property for the lower price, at that point that we made that decision, we did not have a different option. So we always need to go back and think, okay, back then, two months ago or half a year ago, when I sold this thing or 20, whenever it was, right? At that yep. point, I did not have a better deal and I made the best decision at that point. I could have decided to hold off, but I didn't, right? I didn't uh, wait. I decided to take the money that was available then. Um, and now, two months later or whatever it is, now I have a better option. 
But when I made the decision that this possibility could happen, I decided, no, I don't want to wait for a better option in two months. I take the decision now to take the deal that's on the table, the, the cash that's on the table, uh, and go with it. We always need to remember that, right? I mean, if, if time is in your favor, that's great, like in your case. But time can also, like you said, be uh, in your disadvantage and you know things you know the market can tank and you can basically have a bad or worse offer so i think the fact that you take a decision at some point with a certain level of certainty that okay I, i'm happy with this deal now i think you need to seriously consider rewarding that even going forward because like you said right if there's an upside it's great but if there's a downside you're you're laughing and you're happy that you took the deal for for the higher price so I think when you make a decision, when you sign a contract, I think consider it that that was the best decision you could do at that point in time. And it's always good to, I think, to stick with that for the most part, unless, like you said, you can turn it into a win-win. Um, I, I sold many of my houses to owner occupiers, so people that are actually going to buy it to live in it. Yeah. Can you imagine, right? Because some, sometimes it takes a couple of months before people actually move, can move in. Uh, I've had this situation where people came around and said, hey, you know, I'll, I'll give you whatever more to buy it off you, right? I basically destroy this family's hope of moving into their new house, right? They've, yeah. they've been dreaming of, they've taken their, their mother, their grandmother there, look, this is where we're going to live, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm going to come in saying, sorry, um, canceling the deal, I'm selling it for 200,000 more or 50,000 more, whatever it is, right? The number is. And destroying somebody's dream that has, you know, hope to go and live in that house. I can't bear that, right? I can't do that. Um, and it has happened many, many times. So that's what I wanted to add. So the concept of time you always need to consider, right? It's always good to the re go back to the time that you made the decision. Did you make the best decision at that point in time? If so, then, you know, try to stick with it or at least, you know, honor the obligation and find a good way to get out of it. The other one that I wanted to add is you're talking about how you treat people, right? We should definitely not underestimate the power of treating people well and the danger of treating people shitty or bad. Because, you know, if you're doing, if you're ripping somebody off, uh, people tend to talk a lot more about that to others than uh, when you treat them well, unfortunately. So we need to build up this, in a business, you need to build up goodwill. As a person, right, as a business owner, you need to build up goodwill. You need to build up credibility you need to get people to like you you need to get people to give you good recommendations um for now right if i do a talk or if i help if i share something online or do a webinar or whatever i always ask people can you please write me a recommendation not so much because i want to listen to how good i am online but i want to build up that that credibility and that goodwill from others saying you know look this guy is trustworthy credible um and, and that goodwill takes time and it can be destroyed very quickly if you rip one person off in a bad deal because that news goes around like wildfire because people tend, like to tend to talk about drama and, and bad stuff that they have experienced. And like you said, the world is a small place. And um, if, if you treat somebody bad, uh, people that do business with you for the first time, you shouldn't underestimate how much due diligence they do and how easy it is, right? If they Google my name, if they Google your name, uh, they can find stuff about us especially if somebody got, you know, crazy, took us to court, or that stuff is there forever. Yep. Um, I've got a good friend who uh, went through a really uh, tough legal situation. The problem with that is that those, those traces never go away, right? If, there is a, if there's a legal trace somewhere where you've gone to court or even, you know, you got into the newspaper for something or, uh, you know, you got into uh, whatever, somebody wrote a terrible thing about you on Trustpilot or wherever it is, Google your name and your name is so unique. You think that, you know, uh, there will be many Eric's in the world. Yes, but there's only one Eric Ten Hag in Indonesia. And you, if you Google him, you'll find everything about me, right? Including my business history, etc. So it's very, you need to be really careful. And I think goodwill and and credibility is something that, you need to keep building all the time. And in, in situations when times get tough and money is involved, that's where a real character shows, I think. And that's where you need to really consider, okay, it, what, what it's, it's always hard to connect the dots going forward. It's always hard to see where this will lead. Um, but if you look backwards, you can always, you know, pinch yourself for a stupid decision you made in the past that's still ha haunting you today. Uh, and we can say that because we're, you know, old farts that have made a lot of these mistakes. And, and therefore, you know, for people that are new at this, you know, <laughs> don't, don't, don't blow it for your future because these things do, you know, do haunt you. I'm not saying that, um, 
you, you can't rebuild credibility. You definitely can. Um, one part in that I think is always to acknowledge the mistake. So if people bring up uh, something something dark from your past or something bad from your past, you can acknowledge it and say yes, uh, that was a that was a wrong thing to do. Uh, I worked with the wrong business partner. That business went bankrupt, for instance, or uh, that person got upset with me, or that vendor got upset with me. This and this is what happened. Um, I should have handled it differently. And if you do that, then obviously you can rebuild some of the lost credibility. But it's um, yeah, it takes effort and and I think uh, values that that you have in the right place to uh, to really do that. So that's what I wanted to add to it. Jeff. No, actually, uh, when you were adding, uh, I had a couple of things, actually, that I wanted to add to your addition. Go ahead. Uh, so l- let me add more. I actually had another phone call today. And that's a guy that has, uh, he sent me an email out of the blue uh, four days ago. And um, he said, you know, do you mind actually having a chat? I went to one of your events about two years ago. Um, I've been following you after that, everything that you do, and now I'm doing deals and I just want to have a chat with you. I'll pay for your time, whatever it is. And uh, I look, I'm very abroad with that kind of when someone reaches, I'm like, okay, you, you tell me what is it you want to discuss. Tell me what you've done. Tell me what I can do to help you because I'm not going to waste my time if I feel like this conversation is not going to get anywhere. Uh, I'm very mm-hmm. with the way that I, that I, you know, spend my time. But look, he sent me everything right away. He was very diligent. I, I actually saw that, you know, it is something that potentially could be good. And uh, I had that conversation with him. I talked to him literally after watching the football game today where we destroyed Germany. How good was that? Spain 6, Germany nil. What a great wow. day. 6 nil. So um, I called him um, and at 11 a.m. And he started by just uh, reminding me when we met. And I honestly don't remember. I, there is there is no way I could remember that. It's two years ago. I don't know how many tens of thousands of people I've talked to after that. So I don't know who he is. But it's like, you know, one of the things that you did that stuck to me was that at the end of day three, it's a three-day event that we did together, um, they, there was a pitch, right? So you were selling a $38,000 mentoring product. Right. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's what I do. He's like, yeah, but... Do you remember what you did? I'm like, nope, I don't remember what I did or what I said. <laughs> if I said okay. something bad, you know, I apologize, but that's yeah. the way I do stuff. He's like, no, no, quite the opposite. You actually told me not to do it. So I went there with my friend and uh, you literally took us to the corner and said, uh, you guys are already doing things. Keep going mm-hmm. on that direction. You never know what will happen in the future, but at this stage, I don't think this is the right thing for you to do. Mm-hmm. And he's, I've never had anyone telling me that, right? So for us, it was very motivating because we felt like we were actually going in the right direction and we had someone's support um, that knew what he was doing and what he wanted to do. And um, look, we've done really well and I have a few hundred grand now that I want to invest and want to do into something else. So you see how interesting this is, right? So sometimes people say, well, that was 38 grand sale that you lost. Yes, but it was the right thing to do at that stage. Yeah. And it comes back to you in hundreds of thousands of dollars later on, a couple of years later. That happened again today. And mm. it just, again, that, that's probably why I've been pushed. I didn't even think, I didn't even put two and two together of these two concepts, right? But um, this is what happens when you do the right thing. Uh, yeah. it, it feels right. Just do it. Just say it. And, and I think that at this stage, we live in this fucking PC world of trying to to be nice and everything else, instead of just telling people what they need to hear at times, even if it hurts, right? And um, people are not strong enough to just say what seems reasonable to say, whether it is, hey, you know, I, let's split it 50-50. Uh, mm. Just do what's right. Man. Talk, talk like a man at times when it's like business. And I don't mean it in a despective or chauvinistic way or anything like that. Quite the opposite. I think that a lot of people are lacking male energy, especially males at this stage. Uh, and that male energy is actually getting stuff through, putting things, uh, finding a, a solution, an outcome, right? Mm. Uh, uh, we've been feminized uh, basically by movies, everything else, uh, that it's taking our strong masculine energy to get shit done and to do it in a way that we don't give a shit about what people think. See, that feminine energy, it's all about 
being aware of the, the environment and everyone else and everyone's thoughts and so forth. Masculine energy is about breaking through and getting shit done. And we just have very little of that. Uh, and I think that in business, you need a lot of masculine energy because you need to find solutions. Yes, you need an empathy. I agree with that. Definitely. And, and it's always you need to have a right balance, but we're just lacking. We just don't have the masculinity anymore. And that's mm. why people tend to be a little more underhanded and they don't say what they need to say. And they, they're too scared of a confrontation and they're too scared of, of pissing people off. Well, no, nah, I'm not. I just I'm really, really happy to piss someone off mm. and happy to say things as they are. Uh, and I know that you, it's not going to win everyone's, um, I'm not going to be everyone's best friend, but the people that like me actually know that that's what it is. It is not going to be stabbing the back. It's just straight up and I will say it as it is. And, and it's not meant in a hurtful way. It's meant in a way that I feel is, is the best thing that I can say or do at that situation. Yeah. So this example is something I want to dwell upon a little bit more. So isn't this amazing that somebody that, uh, you don't remember because it's two years ago. They were in a crowd of lots and lots of students. Uh, at that moment, you don't even know these people personally. You just know their story and their circumstances on, on where they are. Uh, you're selling a $38,000 mentoring product and you look at these guys and they're already on their way. They're already investing. They're already doing stuff that is, is getting them to where they want to be. Uh, this might not be necessary for them to be successful, right? And then you tell them, well, I think you don't need to buy this. I think you need to get out and just do more deals. You do this from uh, from a core of having your values right, from a core yep. of, uh, you know, you're selling a product, but you're selling a product from the point of view that I only want to sell this to people who need it and who, by buying this, will make such a big jump in what they do that they actually can make the money back. Usually that's how it works, right? If, if, they, if they pay... If they pick a product like this, uh, we give them so much value. We, we help them get on the property ladder. We get them to help them to get them a few deals. Uh, and they can make that money better. And you go, well, mm, I don't even think you need this. So you make that decision in a split second two years ago. And that's what I was talking about, right? This, this credibility and, and, and goodwill and, and positive uh, references take time. Two years later... These people reach out and said, hey, by the way, now, now I'm ready for your help. Now I'm ready to, you know, I've, I've got money free. Can you help me do more? And this is, this is exactly the example of how it works, right? And would you have taken these people's money two years ago? Uh, first of all, they might get into trouble because it's a large amount of money. It might have been, you know, the only cash they had available to, to move on. Uh, and they would maybe not reach out because they would be frustrated with the product or it wouldn't be right for them. So... It's so hard sometimes to, again, when money is involved, to make the ethical right decision over the financially best decision. It's really, really tough. But it, it just proves the point that uh, good doing, a, doing something right uh, you know, comes back to you in a different way later on. I've had so many people that uh, are now coming to me for, for advice or for, um, how shall I say this, for, for potentially investing with me who, you know, I, I have built relationships with over years um, and not consciously with the idea that they might invest sometime. But the thing that I always believe is that if you treat anybody right, that word gets out to other people as well, right? So I'm sure you have stories as well about people investing with you. They bring their friends, right? They bring others that, uh, that, that ride on the goodwill you've created with one person. So these things are really, really important. Uh, and it's not, you know, to look at these things on a case-by-case -case basis. It's really, you know, what do what's right and trust. And it depends on, you know, how spiritual or how religious you are or if you believe in karma or not. But trust the fact that doing the right thing in the moment is always the best thing to do for things happening to you in the future. So, yeah, that was a beautiful, beautiful uh, share that you did there, David. I really, really like that. Yeah, it, it's just really funny that everything seems to be happening, you know, and, and it, it always happens like that. This is not the first time. And I have so many clients that have actually come through and they're family members, brothers, sisters, parents, cousins, um, very close friends. And they come to you because you've treated someone the right way because they're raving about it. They become fans, right? Yes. Uh, and I always, uh, always learned the whole concept of, of creating raving fans. 
And I think that's part of what I wanted to do as well with this podcast. It's going a little bit wider and actually creating fans. Just be like, okay, no, I know what this guy is all about. Uh, I get it. You know, I get it. Like, I may not like him, but I get it. Uh, mm. And I don't want everyone to agree with me or to like me. I don't have any intention like that. I'm quite cool with people not liking me. Actually, I think we should talk about that on the next podcast. I think that that is a big thing. Uh, yes. it's, it's something that's been on my head for the last few days. It, you okay not to be liked? Oh, yeah. I absolutely love not being liked. I think that any kind of reaction is a good reaction. It's like marketing. But I think that um, we need to discuss this in, in, in a whole new different thing because it, it's, it's another hour, literally, yeah. very, very yeah. easily. Um, but it's so essential to just be able to just get on with what you're doing and, and not worry about that stuff. You need to have a very clear compass of where you're going. And people yeah. are in that, absolutely lacking that. And when you have that clear compass and you do those things, make those decisions, things will come back to you tenfold. And, uh, and it's not religious or I, I, I absolutely hate things like the secret and shit like that. You know, it's like mm. universe will provide. Every time I hear that, it, my, my, boil, my, my blood boils. It pisses me off <laughs> people. <laughs> like an entitlement kind of bullshit you know no no you still need to be smart you still need to work and do things that other people are not prepared to do if you want to get those things it's not just because you're a good human being you, good things are going to happen to you quite the fucking opposite actually i know a lot about really good people that get screwed left right and center because they're not thinking okay so you mm -hmm. cannot just be good and not think and if you don't like that you're a freaking idiot, seriously, because you are going to be struggling for the rest of your life. If you're okay with the struggle, that's fine. But that's your prerogative. I'd rather not struggle, to be perfectly honest. Maybe that's egotistical or narcissistic or whichever way you want to call it. I'd rather actually have a pretty chill, happy life. Uh, but don't think, don't, don't expect things to come to you because you're a good human being. It's, it doesn't happen like that. You still need to make the right financial decisions, the right decisions overall. And sometimes they're not hard decisions. Sometimes you need to choose between something bad and something worse. I think that that's what Obama said once, you know, like my job is so hard because I need to choose. I, I don't choose between good and bad. I choose between bad and worse. Mm. And that is the only time that you require a true leader, right? When someone needs to, to make a separation between someone losing a lot of money or someone losing even more. Uh, that's fucking hard. And that's what we get paid to do. Uh, and it is complicated, it's not easy, and you have to have your morals right, your compass right, um, but you have to be aware of what what you're doing, how you're doing it, and, and stop uh, feeling entitled about, if I do the right thing, I'm going to get things back to me. It's not, it's not that simple. It really isn't. You need to keep doing the right things in a way that's logical. You need to be doing smart things. You cannot just... For example, I didn't tell everyone that wanted to buy the 38,000 program not to buy the 38,000 program. Quite the opposite. If it was borderline and I wasn't sure, I wasn't going to stop them from buying it. I was going to push them as hard as I possibly can so that they buy it because I believe in that product. Yeah. So I'm more than happy to sell $38,000 programs. And I've sold freaking hundreds of that of that program. I, I wasn't going to say over a 1,000, but yeah. So it's it's pretty freaking full on and I will keep doing it because I believe in the product. It's a product that yes. works. But at the same time, when I knew that there was someone that was not there for them, I, I did the right thing. So uh, what, what someone in title would feel is that they will look at whichever sad fucking story they're telling them and why they shouldn't do the $38,000 program. And they'll be like, okay, no, you have a sad story. Don't fucking do it. No, no, bullshit. Do it. Your story is irrelevant to me. Your story can drive you forward or it can push you down so it's not it's not about giving in it's about knowing what's better for someone else but you still have to make those tough decisions and that's what entitlement and the secret kind of stops you from doing really yes it's just, just be a good person and, and nature will provide just tell send that energy out there bullshit you send on the energy that you want to send there it's not going to get you anyway uh, make the right decisions then things will happen for you Use your fucking brain. This is not about energy. It's about the brain. It's not um, energy will give you happiness potentially, but not financial success. Yeah, yeah. I'm am I'm, I'm slightly of a different opinion there. I do agree that um, sending the right energy out there without taking action is futile. 
So I believe, really believe in the combination. And for me, it's sort of, yeah, sending the energy out there. But also what I, what I do on that front is very actively visualize where I want to go. And, um, you know, that's sort of the way you could say is, you know, I'm, I'm sending my message to the universe. I'm sending my energy to the universe of what I want to achieve. But it's not like, hey, this is Christmas. This is my wish list. No, 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 no. I envision and feel where I want to take my life. That's where it always starts. Where do I want to be in a couple of years? What do I want to do? How do I want to live? Who do I want to be with? And visualizing that in, for instance, in a meditation or in any other practice anchors the drive that I have every day to do what I do. That's really what it's about for me. And I think if you do that without taking any action, without using your head, without doing the, the real world stuff, it's completely futile. You can't, you can't meditate a check in the mail. Right, you cannot meditate a check in the mail. It's impossible, but you can meditate and you can envision the the things you want to do with the money you want to, you know, realize in your life. But then you, you know, then you need to get up and do the work and you know, uh, get smart about things and 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 use your head, as you say. So I, I agree with that. What, one thing I wanted to add, David, here is um, the I think both of us have this is the attitude of uh lack uh, how shall i say this the, the the attitude of maybe abundance or lack of scarcity or or what i'm saying is that i, I this came this ca- this came this this came to the, yeah, I like it. The, 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 this this came to me yesterday um yesterday very often this happens especially now since we're you know back with the podcast lots of people are reaching out because they know you me we're in property so yesterday I had a call from a friend uh, who was who wanted to reach out and say, hey, you know, me and my, my buddies, we want to start a property portfolio in the UK. Can, and it always starts with, can I pick your brain, right? That's, that's the pickup line. Yeah. And um, there's two ways to look at this, which is you can have the attitude of, I'm not going to share my years of experience with this guy for free. That could be an attitude. Or you could say, you know, um, nice guy, let me just get on the phone with him and uh, tell him what I know. And that's the last thing. That's what I always do, right? So, and I go. I spoke to him about what's your strategy, what's your cash flow situation, how much money do you have, uh, where do you want to invest, where do you have resources, right? So, basically, the, the key things we go and dig into in property training, right? What's your strategy? Where's what? What is a location where you can execute that strategy? And then, what is your property? And then you look at: Do you have a team? Can you build a team, etc.? So, I basically did a half an hour quick property course with him. I could go. Why am I sharing this stuff for free? Okay, so here's why I'm sharing this stuff for free. First of all, this is basically the basics of property that you can Google. So there is no this is there's no secret sauce here. There's no no you know real secrets in this. And secondly, the way that I look at this is that okay, if he's a friend and he's he's a nice guy, I want to make sure that he doesn't make any stupid mistakes and uh, goes and does something that makes sense. Uh, and secondly, the way that I look at this is that look, again, you never know. If they want to be in property in the UK, fantastic. I might be able to do a deal with them. They might be able to come with deals to me. I might be able to join venture. I might be able to source resources or source uh, investment. You never know. So the attitude of abundance, that was a word I was looking for. The attitude of abundance when you're sharing knowledge and information, I think it's fine to do that. Yes, of course, you know, we're going to have uh, paid products that people can buy, but it doesn't mean that a lot of stuff that is relatively straightforward, we can share for free because if it helps people make a huge jump in their thinking, they will remember this. People remember this stuff. They remember what you tell them. Uh, I was in a, in a, in a, I'm doing a, um, a training on uh, LinkedIn marketing and the guy there, uh, Wesley, great, great guy, Matt, Matt and Wesley, they say people are always listening. That's the, the phrase they use. So whatever you put out there, all the stuff you put out there, people are always listening. People are listening to a podcast and the podcast builds our reputation, builds our track record, builds our presence. So yeah, that, that was something I wanted to add that if if you deal with people and if you talk about morals and ethics, I'm always like, I'm if, I, if I'm on the phone for half an hour, I'm going to tell them everything that I can tell them to help them uh, in the in trusting that it will come back at some point. Oh, 100%. And uh, the scarcity thing or abundance is such a big deal, isn't it? Right. Uh, I actually had one of my clients, a uh, really cool guy, actually. Uh, again, I love the guy, young guy. He's done some some really fantastic deals. And he does it generation um, Y, uh, millennial, you know. So it's very altruistic. 
uh, very socially driven. I absolutely love that. That way of living, I am I'm absolutely in love with. Yeah, we're not, born too early, man. We're not Gen Y. That's the problem. I know, but I, I feel like I have a lot of Gen Y in me. <laughs> you want to be young, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> David has a lot of Gen Y in him, guys. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck that's funny actually <laughs> yes yeah, so, so for me it, it's so good to see you know that that, that social thing that awareness of yeah. the the world right that they have it, it's really beautiful it, it seriously makes me smile every time that i talk to him and we get to have deep meaningful conversations and he's 20 fucking six 26 he's a kid you know i'm 43 17 years i could have he could be my kid um, it's it's nuts. So uh, so it's some really cool stuff. He's actually living now in Holland, of all places. He's got a Dutch girlfriend. Funny. Enough. I feel for him. <laughs> and uh, he's uh, he's doing some he, he's doing some mentoring, now, some coaching and mentoring. Yes. And uh, I'm like, fucking great, man. Well done. Blah blah blah. And he um, he sent me a line, and actually he sent me a screenshot of what one of my old business partners sent him. He's like. Well, that's fucking nice of you to steal our shit and try to do your own thing. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, that that is that's a difference. You see, the difference is awesome, well done. What can I do to help you? While the other one is thinking, you know, you're trying to screw me over. Mm -hmm. I think that's the difference between, and again, that's why I don't do stuff with that guy anymore. You know, that's the difference between someone that 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 is gonna move forward and someone that's gonna get stuck in the past. You know, in and I always like to look at the future. I like, um, to be honest, I like to look at the present more than the future. I live more in the present. That's always that's been one of my biggest assets, I think. Um, and again, that's that's another big topic that potentially we could talk on for another hour or two. Um, past, present, and future. I think that 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 destroys people's um, um, ability to invest and to live a good life. Um, but uh, it's so interesting to see that reaction. And I'm like, yeah, I remember, that's why I don't like that guy. That's why yeah. I, I don't do business with him anymore, because it didn't feel right. It didn't, it, nothing resonated with me anymore. And and I honestly, I genuinely tried to help him. I just sent him a couple of extra things so that he can add on to what he's doing, because there's plenty of people. And look what he's teaching. It's not going to be the stuff that I'm teaching. It's very mm -hmm. different. The way that he's doing property is very different to the way that I'm doing property. And the way that I teach property is very different than the way that he teaches property. And I believe that, that there is a teacher, there is a educational product for different people at different levels. So it doesn't affect me in the slightest. And there's so many people around. And it is, it's pointless to, to freak out about that. Quite the opposite. I think that it just brings more, especially if it's good people, and I know he's a good guy, uh, the more good people into the industry, the better the industry becomes. The more money that we all make, the more profitable, the more successful, the happier that we all become. Um, that's my way of looking at it. Anyone that wants to get in the industry, please, uh, yeah, reach out to us. I'm, I'm all for helping out and, and getting the industry to a level where people can say, you know what? I'm doing a wealth education course. And instead of people feeling like, oh, are you sure about that? Are you, are you not getting scammed? I want people to be thinking, that's awesome. Which one are you doing? I'm doing one as well. That, that's what I want it to be um, because at the moment we're not there yet and we're not there yet because there are a lot of freaking dodgy assholes out there and uh, and that's a reality. So we need to get more good people like this guy, like ourselves, just out there uh, teaching really good stuff that's helping people, that's genuine, that's good, so that the industry overall increases. And when the industry goes up, it's basically going with the current, right? All the ships go up when the tide goes up. So we just want the whole tide to go up. When you're just thinking about your boat, you're going to end up sinking anyways. Just, just think about the tide. Think about everything else. Let's think about the tide. We spent uh, almost an hour talking about business ethics, morals, uh, how to do the right thing at the right moment, um, how things carry with you, how your reputation is so important. I think we touched on a lot of topics related to this, David. Yep. Um, I think it's been a great episode and I hope lots of people have value and get value out of this. And I would say we carry on and uh, 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 inventorize the other topics we were just talking about and we'll put those in another podcast episode of The Lazy Money Machine. See you guys in another one. Thanks for that, Eric. 
been listening to The Lazy Money Machine. Find out more at LazyMoneyMachine.com.